Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's special presentation here in Palo Alto, California and going all around the world with watch parties in Atlanta, Istanbul and London. And of course we broadcast all around the world. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante and Rob Strecce here for the Analyst Roundtable, breaking down IBM's future ready storage. Preparing and extending the boundaries of the data center. Gents, great to see you. Uh, we just had a great live event with IBM, co-produced with IBM. Pushing the data center boundaries, no data center, no cloud, but, but data center specifically because of storage, Dave. So, you know, this is a key part of the conversation, which is, hey, the future's coming here, it's now. The future's now, uh, AI's now. Infrastructure is really, really hard. So, you know, the, how do you see AI transforming this? If this is an AI push and IBM's responding, what's your, what's your take? Well, I think it's timely because you have these kind of opposing forces of the budget constraints at the high level, at the, the macro, and you've got the demand for innovation because everybody's trying to race AI. So having infrastructure that is you know, perpetual, the last storage you'll ever buy, uh, that's efficient, that's you know, keeping, keeping pace, it's a very timely conversation, I think. And so, yeah, IBM, I mean, they're back. And uh, I think I've said, I haven't yeah. been this excited about IBM in a long time, I know. They just had earnings. Yeah, you know they they little 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 shy on the on the top line, but that underscores I think the macro that I'm talking about. But they managed it, the bottom line. They beat pretty significantly, and you know as we know they're making some pretty big acquisitions. Yeah, and the, and the miss was also more on the services side, on the infrastructure side. They actually did yes, really well, right. and we're yeah. climbing. I, I think what's also interesting is that a lot of people are bringing the AI to the data and the data is in the data center. And we see this in the ETR data where we see a leveling out of 50-50 between new applications going cloud or being on-premise. And I think a lot of that does have to do with this AI push. What are some of the hurdles companies have to face? Because obviously the on-prem action, on-premise action is because the data is there and it's proprietary to the company, which becomes also property. Is the hurdle performance, budget? I mean, because they're basically saying, we'll assure that your price and upgrades from performance is going to be maintained. That kind of is a cloud-like vibe, right? That is like saying, okay, I'm not going to over-provision cost and hardware. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different companies doing as-a-service types of offerings. And I think a lot of that has to do with people like to buy in that you know, cloud-like manner. But when you start to look at it, CapEx still actually has some really great financial advantages for these organizations that are deploying on-premise. And I, I think, again, it's still cheaper than cloud. I mean, you don't get like the minute scaling, but you get a lot of really good, hey, I can get, you know, over two petabytes in one rack you for, you know, 30,000, 50,000, somewhere in that range. You don't fully generally, provisioned. I mean, generally renting is more expensive than owning, right? And so, but there's another sort of hidden message here, which really wasn't part of IBM's messaging, but I think it's sort of the next round is, when you talk about assurance, they were talking about assuring that life lifetime value of the storage, but there's also, you know, the, one of the biggest hurdles with AI, of course, is compliance and regulation and legal edicts within the organization. And increasingly, as you move AI to the data, which is, by the way, where the intelligence should be, it's just you couldn't, you couldn't afford it before because it was too slow. But as you move AI to the data, you can start bringing some of that assurance and deal with some of those concerns. And the upgrades are happening too from, a, from a their standpoint, but you bring back the, the you mentioned forklift upgrade in, in one of the sessions. You know, you're talking about TCO, you know, total cost of ownership. You're talking about refresh cycles. Storage is never going away. AI is certainly going to change the game with data management, Rob. We talk about the cube all the time. Right. IBM has Red Hat. They just bought HashiCorp. So you got the DevOps cloud native movement. The infrastructure is under massive refresh in general. And so you look at the market everyone's waiting to develop on top of infrastructure that's not yet ready for AI yet. So essentially nothing's AI ready yet, Rob. This is a key part. And the developers are like waiting on the sidelines, like, oh, come on, let's get game on here. Well, I, I think one of the interesting points, and I, I think Jim Comstock brought it up, uh, part of it was talking about Ansible and how you're starting to see that populate across the boundaries within IBM where they're bringing automation from people love Ansible playbooks and they love to do the automation in there and be able to simplify that. That with, you know, again, assuming yeah. what they do with Hashi and Vault and uh, Terraform and all of that, you can look at the automation stack that they're going to have yeah. along with the AI ops 
pieces that they're announcing and bringing the intelligence closer to the storage, I, I think it's, it's a winning combination from a perspective of how do you service that over your lifetime and how do you understand and sweat that asset? And I think that's a big piece of it. You remember, we, we've done the Cube so long, Chef and Puppet were kind of the hot you yeah. know, uptakes and then Ansible's done so well in the market. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at Ansible, and Red Hat now owns Ansible, as we all know, but if you look at now HashiCorp in the mix. Rob, your, your, your analysis on, on the Cube research on the HashiCorp was right on point. By the way, it was, you were saying that before the announcement, so your hot take was hotter when it wasn't hot, now it's hotter. <laughs> so good job on that. But HashiCorp represents something interesting because now you have Red Hat, going to end up driving and converting HashiCorp back into open standards, and then Red Hat will manage it for the enterprise. And then that speaks to IBM's overall strategy, which as we've been digging into, it's looking pretty good, and, and Arvin's got it. It's cloud operations, distributed computing cloud operations. That means Watson X, Red Hat, two major killer apps on the, fr on the, on the, on the, on the board, and then all of IBM's other stuff, which by the way, flash systems, it's storage, it's gear, it's hardware, it's under the covers. That's going to drive value up. So if, if what IBM is doing is essentially bringing that together, and we heard the product manager say, hey, cross domain management with their insights. And so you're starting to hear orchestration. So I think you're going to see this layer of storage go invisible with the consumption, be financially relevant for the customer so they can turn it up and down based on their needs. And then it's programmable. So you're going to start to see Again, infrastructure as code coming back again, Rob, for full scale DevOps. I mean, what, I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I'm seeing here. I, I, I think it, it, it. What I thought was really impressive. It's not only to the array, like it's not just managing to the array. It's managing to the drive, and it's their technology all the way down there, which is I think gives them an advantage over some others who bring their flash together with you know component parts, and I, I think what's really interesting is how they'll be able to manage this and secure and govern the data all the way down to the drive and life cycle that. And I think that's one of the yeah. keys when you start to look at what people are going to encounter as they bring larger workloads like AI back on-prem that or create it there. Yeah, and if you look at the market, Dave, Rubrik was the first one to pivot to cyber security being a storage company. They just went public. 20% pop on the IPO, we'll see how that does. IBM and everyone else is leading with cyber resilience, which is essentially code words for backup and recovery, which is tied into ransomware, which is a security threat. So again, you're starting to see that abstraction layer where storage is still going to be the underpinning, but the technology conversation is not storage, unless you need to go in and talk about why they're advanced. So it's an interesting time. So it never goes away, but it has to be compatible right. with well, the operating environment, and to your point. You know, it, it, do they do they hang? And, and so the question is, is that how does IBM storage stack up against the competition, knowing that there's a whole IBM strategy in front of it? Well, I just wanted to also comment that that the built-in three-site replication was pretty interesting because you you've been there, you know how yeah. complicated this stuff is, and it used to be a complete science project. So that was that's pretty interesting. And in terms of how they stack up, I think this non-disruptive migration is 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 really, really important. I think eventually it's going to become table stakes. I mean, it has to, because people don't want to be doing the disruptive migrations. It just doesn't make any sense. But that enables some of the things that we heard about today. Yeah, and, and I think also, again, it goes back to controlling that whole stack and being able to cycle through it and understanding all the pieces and parts so you can do things non-disruptively. I think, again, bringing it to bear, to, to your point, John, making it transparent, and so that you don't really manage the system. So you're really managing the data, but not managing the system. I think that's the key. And I think one of the comments that was talked about, about how you control the bat blast radius to two terabytes versus two petabytes. And really, that's something that you talk about in cloud. When you're building out a cloud service, you start to look at what is, if this gets hit, what is the blast radius? And, and the other thing is, you know, to your point, to your question about how does it stack up a competition, storage is going to get more intelligent. There's going to be AI infused yeah, in the storage. Point. And so IBM, you know, they own AI and they have a lot of AI expertise. You know, the, others can partner, but you know how it is when you have, when you're designing an end-to-end -end system, you know, you're an operating system yeah. mindset, right? Yeah. So they've got some advantages there in my opinion. And so the market I think is, is swaying to them. I think the other thing too is, 
you know, they've really done a much better job of aligning their, what's happening with R&D and, and product development and getting that to market. I mean, that's yeah, and I, a I new think, IBM. I think, I think the words we heard on camera here this morning was pools of resource. Yeah. That's very cloud-like, Rob. That's very much like abstracting away the, the, the hardware, but yet they, they have the hardware. When you start hearing about that, you look at the AI systems that we've been analyzing, the key research, is it's clustering, right? So you look at the server market, the PCs and servers, they'd be starting to see them as collections of things. So storage is going to be a collection of pool of storage. So I think IBM's really on point there where they're saying, hey, you can have it any way you want. We got your back and then just go do your thing. Right, and if you think about it, they also did take some technology that was in Red Hat under the hood, some open source that has actually led to the three site replication and things of that nature. But you also look to your point exactly with the combination of this cloud is not a place, it's an operating model. And that's what they're leaning, IBM is leaning hard into that, that do the right thing in the right place on the right gear. And that may be on-prem, that may be in the cloud, it's going to probably be multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, super cloud in nature for them. All right, future ready storage, what does that mean to you guys when you hear that term? Uh, obviously redefining this data center boundaries, look at that's kind of a tagline, but I mean, boundaries implies edge, data centers everywhere, data centers the cloud, data centers the edge, servers are clustered, storage is pooled, memories available. Dave, what does well, future ready storage mean? Well, I was making the joke to Sam when he was talking about all the benefits of, of storage assurance and future ready that yeah, but you got to be willing to rip and replace the old hardware and bring in the new hardware and doing forklift upgrades and doing really complicated stuff. You got to be willing to give that up if you want to take advantage of this new program. Nobody wants to do that, yeah. right? They want that, to your point, the cloud-like operating model on-prem or hybrid or across clouds and super cloud, if that's the case, and you know, eventually out to the edge. So we said it earlier, storage is everywhere, right? But you want it to be, it's going to be physically distributed, but you want it to be logically managed and you want it as low latency as possible and you know, as durable and as cost-effective as possible. It's that simple. Yeah, I, I think that's it is like being future ready to me shows that these new workloads that we don't even know about, so it's beyond gen AI, it's as things become agents and things of that nature that are distributed out to towers, out to retail locations where you're trying to have that super interactive AI to consumer AI, business to business, that type of workloads being everywhere and big data in small places. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really what being future ready looks and this like. And we're at a generational shift here, both personnel, the kinds of computing that's done. We, you know, with IBM, we'll talk about quantum and other conversations. You got, you know, HPC and AI, you've got cloud native developers, you've got gen AI applications and AI infrastructure is, is the key here. And that's the future, guys. Well, I'll say, you know, one of the things I'll say is, is still, when you look at the ETR data, there's almost 20% of the, the respondents are saying they're not doing anything with gen AI. They're just sort of stepping Sitting back. back. Yeah. And so, why? When you ask them why, it's because, well, things are moving too fast. We, we really don't trust it. The hallucinations doesn't make really you know, a lot of sense in our business today. But I don't think that's the right thinking. I think you have to have a platform mentality, yeah. platform engineering. And yeah. part of that is having storage yeah. that you don't have to mess with all the time. It's just there. I've got an infrastructure. I don't have to worry about it. And I'm going to build my own as a service internally is what the storage assurance is going to support. So IT organizations who have mission critical workloads yeah. on-prem they're going to have that you know, future proof. I know it's kind of a buzzword, but that allows you to start doing experiments, you know, keeping pace, and so that you're not falling behind in the GAI Look, last, race. Last thing anyone wants to do is foreclose the future opportunities. And right now, everybody is tooling away and, and running as fast as they can to get their infrastructure because they ever, as we've been reporting on theCUBE, you guys know we talk about all the time, there is massive demand and appetite for Gen AI applications. The developers are going crazy, the fish are running, and I think IBM's just got to put the net in the water and then they get everybody. So this is where everyone's trying to get to that point where we know the market's hot, but guess what? Doing enterprise large scale infrastructure is hard. Yeah. It's not easy. So moving that fast and whoever can move fast to that wave will be the winner. And it's going to have to look, it has to look like it's just a pool of resource code into the infrastructure. It's infrastructure's code principles, Rob. And that's whoever gets that done for AI is the new AI DevOps in my opinion, not AI ops, but like got to nail the developers. And then on the use cases, all the proprietary data is where the IP is. So you got to have the cool and relevant developer alignment, 
for next generation and then nail the use case where, hey, you want to put a box on-prem or a system on-prem? It has to support the data. Well, it this has is, to support the data and it can't co-mingle unless it's absolutely been programmed to. And this is where the power law comes in, smaller language models yeah. that are domain specific. They've got to they've got to be running on something. You're going right. to have to have some infrastructure there. You know, whether it's, you know, some of that stuff will happen in the cloud, but a lot of it's going to migrate on-prem. But again, we're talking to people who are looking to bring this to factory floors. You're yeah. not you're not going to do that from the cloud because if that, you know, factory floor is disconnected from the cloud, you can't lose your application. You can't lose your AI that people are now utilizing. And I, I think this is where, again, there will be this balancing act between you know, cloud-based, on-prem, in different locations, edge, and edge will mean different to a lot of different industries as well. Well, especially for yeah. low latency stuff, transaction yeah. processing, real-time edge workloads. The edge, you mentioned the edge. Yeah. That's another key, distributed yeah. computing. Guys, we did a milestone here in theCUBE. I want to say thanks to the crew here and the entire team. Thanks to IBM for co-producing with us and bringing this to the table. We did a first in theCUBE. We were at the edge. We were at Atlanta, London, and Istanbul bringing watch parties physically in and groups of people into the Cube. It's been a great event. Guys, thanks for coming on and closing out this analyst uh, round table. Thanks for watching. This was IBM and the Cube producing a great program on future ready storage. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, Rob Streche, and for IBM, thanks for watching. Thank you.